So a key important topic of uh, regulation is, is spectrum, and we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about it. And then the third part uh, is, uh, you know, let's go back to basics. There is still a lot of problem in terms of making sure that access to the internet is equal. So the whole issue about rural-urban divide, a uh, very old issue, how do we think about it within this context of rapid development in infrastructure and, and market uh, uh, conditions? So a lot of questions out there uh, that digital uh, infrastructure is posing for policymakers and regulators. What we know for sure is being a regulator today is not the easiest job but it's definitely not boring, and we will definitely get uh, you know, emerging uh, practices from the research of uh, many of our panelists uh, today. So uh, I'm happy to have the discussion today with uh, Alexia Gonzalez uh, van Follon. She's an economist at the OECD, and she's gonna talk to us about uh, the road to 5G from the OECD experience. Uh, following her presentation, we're going to hear from Edward Otten. He's a senior researcher at Oxford University, and he's going to talk to us about the economics of high-speed internet, um, mainly 5G, but also how it applies to Africa in 4G. Uh, after that, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to have a deep dive on spectrum as a key regulatory issue with uh, Maria Martin uh, Miko Blue. Uh, adjunct professor of the University of Ulu, and she's going to talk to us about the challenges of spectrum uh, regulation for 5G and beyond. So I want to stress beyond, because in this panel we're not going to talk only about 5G, we're going to talk about another G. Uh, and then we have Marta uh, Suarez, president of the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, who's going to talk to us about enhancing connectivity through uh, dynamic spectrum. And then the case of uh, looking at the rural-urban divide uh, and how do we think uh, about it in this new era of digital infrastructure. Uh, we'll have a case study that will be presented to us by Daniel Bukogren <laughs> from Brown University. So let us get started uh, with uh, Alexa to talk to us about 5G. As you know, this is a very important topic. There is a lot of excitement around 5G and the jury is out there whether it's an evolution or revolution. So uh, I'm looking for an answer from the panelists today. Uh, a lot of uh, discussion about the uh, specific technical aspects of 5G, uh, being ultra fast and allowing all this uh, mission critical function. And one of the main uh, features of 5G is really the interaction with vertical industry and the, the new language that 5G will create, including the many, many questions for regulation. So Alexia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. We, the OECD thanks the World Bank and Toulouse for organizing this conference. Um, the presentation is... Who is having the slides? I'm sorry. Yes. There we go. The road to 5G networks. So the reason why we titled uh, the Road to 5G Networks is a, a point of writing. Many OECD countries were in the midst of conducting trials. Also, some of them, um, like for example, Korea and April 3rd had deployed the first uh, 5G commercial network. So what this report tried to co cover is what are the regulatory um, aspects to really pay attention to with all of this experience by the different OECD countries. And in our working party communication infrastructure and services policy, we have 36 OECD countries that send communication regulators to talk about this. Um, next slide, please. Reliable connectivity is essential for the digital transformation, and it's actually this invisible thread that is connecting multiple sectors of the economy, whether it be transport or health or the energy or agriculture sector. We have that access to communication infrastructure at affordable prices and high quality, that's what we mean by reliable connectivity, is really key for a successful and inclusive digital transformation. Sorry, there's a, great, thank you. 
So the combination of new trends in the digital economy, such as the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, will generate massive amounts of, net, of data. And what is connecting this is, is networks. So there is mission critical aspects such as, for example, remote surgery or fully automated vehicles that will rely on networks that have low latency. This is a low response delay. And also that will need really high download speeds which all of this places new demands on communication infrastructure and for regulators and policymakers, we really, the, the stakes are high because the opportunity is unique. Um, the, the slides don't really look, you can't see here, but um, what we'll see in the future, this is a slide where Intel provided some um, estimates of the data deluge. And for example, for fully automated vehicle, it's estimated that one vehicle per day would generate 4,000 gigabits of data. If we see at the OECD average users for a mobile, like normal human as you and I, um, we, this we means it's 26,000 mobile users today. And if we see into smart healthcare or smart industry, the, the demands will be increasing and increasing. So this is where 5G comes in. And what is 5G? There's a promise of it but there's also an evolutionary aspect. It's the next generation of wireless networks coming up from 2G, 3G, 4G, and it promises, based on the ITU IMT 2020 vision, to have three use case scenarios, enhanced mobile broadband, massive machine type communication, and ultra reliable and low latency. It can be a paradigm shift because it's the first time that a mobile generation conceives a world with IoT in it. And for example, massive machine type communications would be these sensors that you see in agriculture or smart cities, which maybe they're not that sensitive to latency and don't transmit that much data, but ultra reliable and low latency communications may be the type of applications that require like a fast response and are very sensitive to latency. And here we would see like fully automated vehicles. So we're talking about a, a network that would be flexible enough to encompass all these different usage case scenarios. And with a new feature that 5G is offering, which is called network slicing, it allows for multiple virtual networks to be catered over one physical infrastructure. But the question is whether it's really revolutionary or is it just evolutionary? And the short answer is that it's both. It's evolutionary because it, in its initial stages, initial stages of deployment as it is today in most uh, 5G commercial networks, it will coexist with 4G and the core part of the network is still 4G. So this, the standard in, in the release 15 standard is like um, non-standalone 5G. Many of the technological innovations, uh, such as massive MIMO um, and network slicing, is also backward compatible. Um, but much, they allow for much more efficiency and performance in, in a 5G network. The revolutionary aspects are likely to kick in after the second phase of standardization process, which is really 16, when we start seeing networks deployed and applications interoperable with that. So this is most likely to be done after 2020. So I was recently in Korea in September. I see Professor Doshin over there, so it reminded me of that. And we spoke to several operators there, and they told us, like, standalone 5G, we'll probably use it for industrial applications, for smart factory, and we're not expecting to deploy after 2020. So they still have to reap the benefits of the early deployments of 5G. In a way, there is a, an evolving uh, competition between fixed and wireless. However, with something that I will talk about just after this slide, uh, network densification, at the wholesale level, fixed and wireless are becoming more and more complementary. But let me talk about the, the retail level and how the evolution of competition has evolved between mobile generations. When we had 2G, is the first time we have mobile voice, voice service, so it's maybe voice between fixed and mobile became substitutes, but we didn't really have mobile broadband. 3G was a standard conceived for mobile broadband, but maybe the promises of 3G didn't ca come after later on with 4G. One of the major changes when 3G were deployed in the early 2000s was the introduction of the smartphone, um, iPhone in 2007, 
that allowed many many of these applications, multi-video, uh, multimedia, and et cetera, to actually um, become a reality. So um, there's still imperfect substitution between streaming and between fixed and mobile uh, broadband. But with 4G, people thought maybe this is the time where like fixed and wireless carriers, at least in the US, are going to compete. Um, still imperfect substitution because the leading edge mobile broadband didn't compare to the leading edge like fiber to the home solutions and also many of the mobile broadband commercial offers were data capped. So now we're in 5G and the first early deployments of 5G are only for the first usage case scenario, enhanced mobile broadband. This is the promise to have a 100 or 200 times the speeds of LTE. Um, so with fixed wireless access solutions, so using the spectrum as the last mile, there's this question that's been raised in several OECD countries. Will fixed and mobile broadband finally become substitutes? And when we see like carriers like Verizon in the US investing from 2017 to 2020, 16 million kilometers of fiber, you start to question whether now like this wireless carrier looks more like a, a fixed carrier. So why is that? Why are wireless carriers going into such large uh, efforts to expand fix the fixed part of the networks? So there's this process called network densification. 5G will also use uh, part of the spectrum that probably will be um, addressed later on, which is the millimeter wave spectrum, as well as 3.5 gigahertz and 700 megahertz. But um, they, they will use different parts of the spectrum and with the having the multiple into input, multiple output antennas, so these and beam forming technology, there's a need to have the, the antennas closer to the user. So where you see up here at the right side, it's a macro cell of today, which will continue to exist for coverage reasons. But when you go down, and that's the lamppost, that's a Verizon 5G antenna in Boston. So if lampposts are the new cell sites, they, they will be complemented with the large cell sites, um, this raises a whole range of, of issues for regulators, such as infrastructure sharing, how many carriers can be in a lamppost, if there's companies that are already buying 15,000 lampposts in, in London, like the company Arkiva, will this be the essential facility to reach to the users? And the reason that it's needed to be so close to the users is basically because at the beginning of the uh, presentation, I talked about the increasing demand on, on data for in this infrastructure. So to reduce latency and to increase capacity, you need to have these um, transmitters closer to the user. And um, this raises several issues that I will address at the, fi the final part of my uh, presentation. Just to give you an idea of the global status of 5G deployment, as of September 2019, 5G commercial networks, not trials, networks that are also running, were deployed in nine OECD countries through 18 operators. And Korea was one of the first, actually, so many claims is the first, on April 3rd, that it deployed 5G networks. And I had the pleasure and opportunity to actually measure the quality of service of these networks in September, and it was one gigabit per second average. So pretty, pretty good. Um, but there's also other countries, and I would like to see here, like you see well, there's one that says 586 cities covered. This is Switzerland. And Switzerland, with two of their carriers, Sunrise and, and the other uh, carrier, they're basically almost about to reach 90% population coverage with 5G networks. One of the reasons the regulator esteems that this has happened is because in their spectrum auction design, they allowed, they it actually allowed for s all players to have sufficient spectrum. So going back to the basics, what is needed to facilitate the deployment of 5G networks? The stakes are high because we're talking about connectivity that will have and permeate to all sectors of the economy. So regulars and policymakers ha have to be at the top of their game. And what are OECD countries doing? Um, one of the main issues is streamlining rights of way to facilitate uh, network densification. This means the rights of way like th to have these small transmitters, micro transmitters in cities. One question that is raised is whether cities and municipal um, uh, efforts here will be crucial, will like to extract the same rents that they did with macro cells. Um, 
in many countries such as the US, but other European countries with the new European ele electronic communication codes, there's a strong push to try to limit the, how much can be uh, the expenses for, for this deployment of networks and also uh, to streamline the rights of way of municipalities. It's not always easy because many OECD countries, municipalities have a lot of autonomy. So this will require also an increased co uh, cooperation. Backbone and back uh, hole connectivity, which is the fiber connecting all these cell sites, usually, um, will be crucial. So what we see is that wireless networks become further and further an extension of fixed networks. So we can't just talk about wireless infrastructure. Really, it's, it's both. There's an increase in complementarity. And with this, uh, since the last mile is uh, spectrum, efficient spectrum management will become crucial and new forms of, of spectrum management, such as spectrum sharing or others, or uh, local licenses, um, are, are being discussed and implemented in several OECD countries. Should be noted that it's not like we have five, uh, a spectrum for 5G when we say an auction. Most auctions in the OECDs are technologically no neutral. That being said, there is 5G pioneer bands that have been detected by several countries, and notably in the European Union, which is a 700 megahertz band, the 3.5 gigahertz, and, and millimeter wave spectrum above 24 gigahertz, 26 gigahertz. So with all of this, um, what, what do we need to do? Rights of way, spectrum, backhole and backbone, but the devil is really in the details. It re depends on the regulatory and institutional framework of each country. And with this, I, I'll let it for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> yes. Very nice. It's, it's clearly a brave new world there when with the opportunity that 5G o offers for this uh, mega connectivity. I mean, 5G and IoT together, we're moving to a, a super smart, uh, highly interconnected world. And then that begs the question, what drives investment into these networks? Thank you very much. We need the, the next presentation. Uh. Very good. So Edward will share with us the experience in frontier countries on 5G and then the modeling exercise that you've been working on, uh, the implication on uh, 4G for uh, developing countries. The floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edward Orton, and today I'm going to be presenting on the research that we've been carrying out focusing on the economics of high-speed internet access. Uh, so this work uh, basically started because um, the National Infrastructure Commission uh, was tasked by the UK Treasury to look at how to expedite 5G rollout. Uh, this was back in 2016. Um, so we basically started to develop a software model that could help us answer different policy and regulatory questions about how to uh, foster the rollout of, of 5G. Um, and essentially, a number of the, the, the key conclusions which we pulled from that modeling exercise made it into the executive summary of this document here, which supported the UK's 5G strategy. So firstly, I just want to emphasize the exponentially increasing costs of delivering very high speed uh, 5G access um, to very low population density areas. Um, so you can see here the shape of the curve as you try to move up to 100% coverage. And the last 10% is almost twice the cost of the first 90%. So this is really important to, to consider. And we also need to focus much more on delivering new capex to areas where we don't have good 4G connectivity um, so that we can you know, actually connect vehicles and people working on railways. It's a major productivity drag. And we also used our spatiotemporal modeling um, capability to basically advocate for new policies which looked at here universal service, universal coverage, um, and how that may be tied into to spectrum, or spectrum auctions. Um, so essentially that work led to um, a request from the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs that we apply the modeling capability that we developed to the Netherlands. Um, so I'm just showing you here the, the capacity margin for three different scenarios that they asked us to test. So we want, they wanted to deliver 30 megabits, 100 megabits, and 300 megabits per second per user, and they wanted to guarantee that 95% of the time. So this is really quite ambitious in the busiest hour of the day when everyone's on a 5G network. 
Um, and we tested three different infrastructure deployment strategies. So firstly, spectrum integration, which reused the brownfield macrocellular sites that you saw in the previous presentation and deployed the 5G spectrum bands on them. Um, and then we looked at a greenfield small cell strategy where basically you build a whole new network of very small cells on street furniture like lampposts. And then we looked at a hybrid scenario where you first used, reused your brownfield sites and then delivered small cells. Um, and what you kind of notice quite quickly when you look at the capacity margin, so that's subtracting the demand from the, the available capacity, um, is that spectrum integration uh, performs reasonably well at low capacities, but as you move up to very high capacity scenarios, it really doesn't perform very well. Um, and then that's in contrast with small cells, for example, where you've got quite a lot of capacity um, at very high speeds. Um, but it's important though to kind of put this into context against the costs. Um, so we have the same structure here again, um, so the scenarios versus the strategies. Um, but quite clearly, you can see that the cost for delivering spectrum integration, so reusing existing assets, is really a lot lower than delivering small cells, which you know, can be four, five, six times the price, particularly as you move uh, to low population density areas. And to be honest, the Netherlands isn't particularly low population density, so these costs applied to other locations could be really quite significant. Um, in a recent paper, we developed an open source uh, engineering economic assessment framework. And this is important because often uh, the economic assessment and the engineering assessment take place at completely different steps. So we tried to develop a unified framework that allowed you to assess these in the same um, uh, capability. Um, and uh, that was for all 5G spectrum bands up including millimeter waves. So for example, 26 gigahertz, which um, is one of the key drivers for 5G. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is we applied this framework to look at infrastructure sharing strategies. Now, I've kind of painted a fairly bleak picture of 5G economics so far. So, so we just need to kind of consider what strategies may be available to help us reduce that cost. And the baseline is that each operator builds its own network. Um, but then there are other strategies that we might employ where you share different parts of the infrastructure. Um, and in this uh, graph, you can see on the y-axis the cost per square kilometer. Uh, and on the x-axis, um, this is the intersite distance between the cells. So consider this as the density of cellular assets. Um, but the key finding essentially is that uh, if you compare the baseline of building a single network against um, either sharing um, the site or sharing the backhaul, um, you can actually get up to about a 30% cost saving. Um, and then the final strategy here with the largest cost saving of about 50% was essentially just building a single network and having all of the operators use that single network. Um, and that might not always make sense in, in urban areas, but in rural areas where you've got a lot of spare capacity on the network, this makes a lot of sense because that cost saving can be reinvested back into connecting new areas that aren't currently connected. Um, and at, at this point, I just want to emphasize that it's not just about collecting people, it's also about connecting things. Um, so I've been working with the University of Southampton to couple their transportation model with our cellular model so that we're able to look at the, the connectivity requirements in order to meet demand from um, connected vehicles. Um, so this is just an exa example for the transport routes per hour going into the city of Oxford. And we've connected um, different scenarios of, of electric vehicle penetration, essentially, because they're all going to be connected to the internet, um, to look at what demand that places on the cellular network. I and mean, this is really where our work's starting to go now to introduce dynamic people movements and to understand um, uh, what the cost may be for connecting things to the internet. So they're the assessments that we've done in mainly Europe, um, but I'm actually working with the World Bank now to um, apply this methodology uh, globally to lots of other countries, particularly in the, the emerging economy context. Um, I think I probably was stung a couple of times by making models that were too country specific and then needing to apply them to other contexts. So here what we've been trying to do is actually use the satellite data because it's globally available um, in order to understand uh, how to, to model the rollout of both 4G and 5G. I mean, really, it's about decisions. So how do we support decisions that may be made related to deploying technology, business models, and policy and regulatory options? Um, so really, we want to develop analytics around that relating to the viability of, of connecting people to the internet. Um, so this really takes place in two main stages. Firstly, we look at the demand side. Um, so that's here estimating consumption and wealth assets using satellite imagery. Um, also look, taking advantage of the new settlement layers that have become available globally for population. 
Um, and then on the, the supply side, um, essentially we take lots of data, as much of it as possible from um, OpenStreetMap, other sources, um, so buildings, roads, things like this, and then actually uh, automate uh, the deployment of these networks um, to connect new people to the internet, um, to look at the costs involved in how much uh, that, that might actually be. So a variety of different infrastructure deployment algorithms which try to reduce cost. Um, and that results in a set of results spatially or, or in terms of 2D plots. And I'm just going to give you a couple of slides to, to give you a flavor of that. Um, so in the last couple of weeks, we've been working on a replication study for this paper that was in science, um, coming out of the Stanford Research Group, um, focused on AI for sustainable development. Um, and this is by Neil Jean. Um, and essentially, within about a couple of weeks, we've managed to replicate um, uh, their modeling approach for predicting um, uh, wealth, so consumption and assets, um, just merely by using the, the satellite imagery data and then validating it, firstly training it, but then also validating it against the World Bank's uh, Living Standards Measurement Survey. Um, and obviously the survey is very expensive to do and it's quite uh, specific to places, it's not generalizable that well. So the idea of trying to, to get some sort of predictive capability to apply this to areas which weren't surveyed uh, would, would give us more understanding of, of the potentially, the potentially the on the ground conditions in those areas where we're data poor. So this is how we're trying to approach the demand side and we've applied it currently to Malawi because it had one of the smallest uh, footprints out of the countries that we were interested in focusing on. And then on the supply side, um, we've been working on Uganda to try and deploy this, um, this software code. Um, so if we have a coverage map, so if we know how many people are already kind of covered, then you're able to estimate how many people need to be connected still. Um, and we use the industry standard engineering models for propagation and things like this to design an optimal network and then use that information basically to do the, the policy, the regulatory, the economics and the, the business assessment. Um, but really, you know, prediction is very hard. This is about testing scenarios and about putting evidence there so that um, you can use this essentially as a discussion tool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. sharing your research and I particularly liked uh, the fact that this tool will, will bring, bring the economists and, uh, and the engineers closer, but please do not forget the lawyers. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we mentioned that we wanted to have a deep dive on this session on spectrum issues and our uh, speakers, the previous speakers, both of, both of them spoke about it uh, a little bit, so an opportunity for Maria to go in details about spectrum sharing and your work, plus the 6G. Thank you. Good morning from my side. It's a great pleasure to be here. When I got the invitation from the World Bank and now coming here, I didn't know anybody here. All are new faces to me, so it's a great opportunity to meet the new people. So I come from Finland, from University of Oulu, and I've been there in the academic world for about four years. And all this time, before that, I was at that another research institute in Finland. And my entire 20-year career in the research domain has more or less centered around the spectrum, spectrum management topics, starting from 4G or actually 3G, now, now on 5G, and also in the future, hopefully for 6G. So, what we have done most recently regarding the 5G research, it's ac actually more about the spectrum research, is that we, we realized already five years ago that the major majority of 5G research was focusing on the mobile network operator networks, big MNO deployed networks, but at the same time there was the interest to have these local, local needs serve the verticals. And then we thought that it's not the big MNOs. We had conversations with them in many places, and we realized that they are not the most innovative stakeholders in the market. There are a lot of others who have very novel solutions, vertical-specific solutions. And at that time, we realized that it sh should not be only the big mobile network operators who would be the future operators of 5G networks. So then we started this activity together with the industry. Nokia was the main player, of course, to finish in the Finnish side, and we, we were looking into the research of, of local 5G networks. And we called them already 5G microoperators back, back in 2017. But that was pretty lonely work. We were the only ones doing that. And, and uh, there was a lot of criticism, a lot of, lot of 
feedback from especially the big operators that we will, all, we will do everything, we don't need anybody else to enter the market. So there's this regulation side that the market is very closed. The fo you need a license to operate a cellular network. They are given very infrequently. Normally you have to pay a, pay a lot of money for that. So there is n there's a huge barrier to enter. So what we meant with these 5G micro-operators is that they would operate local, local 5G networks within some facility, within some geographically defined area. And in addition to the network, they could offer very tailored, specialized services. And there's a lot of technical building blocks in the 5G development that support these developments. We're going to higher carrier frequencies. There will be dense small cell deployments. By definition, they are already not local and network virtualization, network softwareization, that reduces the prices paid. So you can now deploy base stations, even the core networks, on general purpose hardware. You don't need to buy very dedicated equipment for that purpose. And at the same time, this calls for spectrum sharing techniques. If you want to have local networks, you cannot get a license for the entire country. It's not, not feasible, so you need to share. But at then we had, we had a national project on this for, for started in 2016 where the national regulator was involved and all the operators and, and uh, in the industry vendors. And we identified that this is a very regulatory, it's a difficult topic. So we need these local spectrum rights. We need to build mainly indoor, it's, we're addressing, if we address like factories or, or harbor areas, there are a lot of indoor deployments. Then who can deploy these indoor networks? And we realized that the regulation is very different in the different countries. In Finland it's easy to deploy, but you need the facility owner's permission. And again, it goes to the very, very difficult part of the operator role, the telecommunications service provider. How it's defined, it does not at all fit the current ev evolution. It's, it's, it, there are a lot of aspects that need to refine, because if you are a telecommunications service provider, you get some, some, you have some obligations, but you also have some rights. But now, are these micro operators telecommunications service providers? It's a case by case decision, and they're not necessarily that, so then they don't have the rights. So when we talked about how, where would these local 5G networks, who would be their customers? That was the first question always emerging. So they could operate a closed network. This is the private networks. They are now becoming a big, big deal, private 4G, 5G networks. But at that time it was not so, so it did, they did not exist that much yet. So they could serve their own closed subscriber group or uh, they could also serve the MNOs customers. For example, in areas where it's difficult for all operators to build their own networks, like metro stations or those kind of facilities, it would totally make sense to build just one network which is shared, uh, which is serving the MNOs customers. And in addition with 5G, with the increasing, increasing network function virtualization, network sizing functionality, so same one and same network, if it has a lot of spectrum available, it could serve a lot of different user groups with different service quality levels. But that, that creates a lot of regulatory burden. So now I would like to focus on the spectrum part because that's been my, my, my main focus for, for a long time. So in principle, it's the stakeholder views have, are very com com conflicting. There are the incumbents who don't want anybody else to come there. There's the mobile sector who wants to get more and more spectrum all the time, and regulators in the, are in the position to take these conflicting views into account. And the MNOs have dominated the 5G spectrum de debate for, for a lot. But now it's, it's the like they did in the sharing discussions. We, we did a lot of spectrum sharing related work in the past, but every time it was the operator's objection that, that stopped that evolution from happening. So now then a few years, years ago, we proposed the spectrum micro licensing model so that regulators would consider assigning local licenses for the deployment of mobile communication networks. And then we also did some study on the value of, spe uh, on the value of spectrum and we d identified the key elements there and we realized that it's a totally different value if you already have a lot of spectrum instead if you don't have anything, then the value of spectrum is totally different. And it really depends also on the f spectrum bands, like the 5G bands, 700 megahertz, 3.5 gigahertz, 26 gigahertz in Europe, they are totally different in terms of their engineering characteristics, propagation characteristics. If you calculate the link budget, you end up ranging from 20 kilometers to 200 meters. So the network deployments, the architectures are, are really, really different. And also the spectrum has, has different value there. But the higher carrier frequency, you have a very, very wide band, which there you can reach these gigabits per second, second targets. But in the lower bands, the, 
bandwidths are very limited, so they are very difficult to model and, and to act, actually compare even. And then we did some study about the 3.5 gigahertz decisions, because those are now available, and we, re we realized that there are a lot of differences, a lot of divergence within the same band. So in practice, we all will be using the same equipment in this band, de delivered by the same infrastructure vendors, same handset vendors in the different countries. But the spectrum access methods, they were quite, quite different there. There were auctions used in many, many countries. Some raised a lot of money, like Italy. Some raised very little money, like Finland. That's because they wanted to give the MNOs money to invest in the network, so that we did not want to collect auction money to the government, but we wanted the MNOs to have money to invest in high-quality networks. Germany, on the other hand, is op has opened part of the band for local licenses. Facility owners can apply already today those licenses, and the cost is not, not much. In Japan, there was still administrative allocation, no market mechanisms at all. And then in the US, for almost 10 years, not quite, but they've been developing a very complicated sharing-based model with different levels of spectrum access rights, guaranteeing that the incumbents can continue and then assigning local rights and also general authorized access, which is a kind of unlicensed model. So very different approaches in the same band where the very same equipment will be used in practice. So then I would like to go one step further, as a research institute, as a research community, we are already looking 10 years ahead from now. So Finland was the first to announce 6G research globally last year. It's appointed, we got the national flagship for eight years from appointed by Academy of Finland because due to our high, high scientific prestige and the high impact that we've created together with the industry. And there we are looking into the year 2030. It's not just that there will be a new generation. It's, it's not that that's not the main, main focus. But we are really looking into the year 2030. And for that, the vision is that our society is data-driven, enabled by near-instant limit, unlimited wireless connectivity. And one thing that we realized when we discussed was that this is the same year target for the UN United Nations un Sustainable Development Goals. So we realized that this work has to be done in very close collaboration, so targeting these Sustainable Development Goals, so that the mobile communication sector would have a clear impact on that. Already that is happening. The GSMA is reporting on that annually. But now in the design of the next generation, this should be the, st the, the starting point. And we actually published already the world's first 60 white paper in September, and now the work is continuing as, as we are now opening the floor for new dedicated white papers targeting the year 2030. And already in the first one, we realized that the local operator models, they will co continue. The MNO networks come, they will deploy 5C no, no matter what. But at the same time, there will be a complementary approach to address the different vertical sector specific needs. So that concludes my presentation. We will ho be hosting the second 60s summit in, May, in March in the Finnish Lapland. We already had the world's first 60s summit there. And there we are working on these white papers. And if you visit the web page, you will see a call for expert groups de dedicated to these topics. And we invite everybody to have a look and join this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's clearly definitely not a boring sector. <laughs> and you know, the, the, the fast and the speed by which we moved from 1G and now talking about 6G, I, I go back to the presentation earlier this morning. Mm, not sure how we compare it with the tracking industry. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us. Um, we'll move to uh, Martha, uh, and she's going to talk to us about uh, dynamic spectrum management. I just wanted to mention that, you know, of course, thank you to everyone who, who made it, but a special thank you to Martha because she drove all the way from Paris after her <laughs> flight got cancelled. <laughs> thank you so much. That's dynamic, Martha. That's clearly dynamic. Well, good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was really motivated to come here and, and have this conference today. I would like to thank the Toulouse School of, School of Economics and the World Bank for this invitation. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is spectrum management. So, um, and it was a great introduction from the previous panelists. Um, I represent DSA, and today I'm going to talk about dynamic spectrum management and just 
a quick introduction about some best practices and new opportunities. Um, so I'm an engineer, and uh, only six months ago, I was working with the government. I was working with the National Spectrum Agency of Colombia. So I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is to, to deal with many stakeholders requiring different um, access and different uh, opportunities for spectrum. So DSA, we are a global cross-industry association, non-for-profit, and our main goal is advocacy. We are promoting efficient use of the spectrum, uh, fostering innovation, and basically what we advocate for is affordable connectivity for all. These are our members. Some of them were quite mentioned this morning. Uh, so I, basically, I represent some of the big high-tech companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook. But also, we represent different uh, research institutions and non-for-profit organizations that are trying to consider how to provide affordable access worldwide, so not only in the developed countries. Um, basically, our mission is to make spectrum abundant for broadband. Uh, connect the next 4 billion people, and let me just give a quick message here. We, have, we are used to have uh, black or white spectrum management approaches. So we, we were talking about how fast is the adoption of the technology. But then when we see how fast this innovation is applied to spectrum management, we find that that is not really innovative. And, uh, and sometimes it's fine. We had a, a great question this morning. It's like investors need some certainty. So big industries have been doing that investment for a while, satellite industry, mobile industry. But the reality is that even despite those efforts, half of the population is not connected. So that's why we consider spectrum management, dynamic spectrum access, as another tool in the toolkit. It's another option to consider. It's not against investment, but it could be a great option to, to connect those people and those objects that will, be, be ar that will be around that are not connected yet. And we think that innovation and technology is, now we have it. I mean, when I was a PhD student a few years ago, we were talking about cognitive radio, and that was the future. And we were like, yeah, we will have cognitive radio, and devices will be very uh, dynamic and so forth, defined radio. Now we have the technology, and now we have the, the systems that could be used for spectrum management. So we think this is the right moment to implement dynamic spectrum access. So quickly, why is, it spec what is, why, is, why is spectrum sharing important today? First, because we need to make networks affordable. Sometimes it's not only a problem of coverage, that is a huge problem, but it's not the only one. Sometimes it's about having affordable access. We could have satellite coverage, but then we, when we see the prices and the adoption of the technology, sometimes it's very, very expensive. Uh, we also need to support rural broadband. Every time we just, I mean, the worst scenario is not, not to do anything. If we keep as we are, if we keep doing spectrum management as we have been doing for a while, the digital gap is going to increase. Because every time there are new applications, there are new data, there are citizens that are connected all the time, um, but there are other citizens that don't have access at all. And that is creating uh, bigger gaps. Uh, I just mentioned about supporting innovation. Um, and when I was mentioning there, there is black or white spectrum management is because we had license or unlicensed. That's basically what we have. And usually unlicensed spectrum is the first step to have innovation. Because if you have a startup, if you have new developments, smart cities, sensors, the first barrier is spectrum. If there is a new company, startup, that wants to test a great solution, but they have to pay a huge amount of money for a license, or they have to go through a very complicated process, they, was they won't be able to, to test their technologies. And then the only way they have to access wireless networks is through an operator. And sometimes that's fine, but in many cases that's very hard for small companies. Even if there are uh, some regulatory tools like secondary market or those kind of things, for small companies it's very hard to negotiate with the big companies. So unlicensed spectrum is really, really fostering innovation. Uh, we need to change also, we think from the SA perspective, that it's important to change the spectrum crunch conversation. And that is a, a question of mindset. Spectrum is limited resource. That's it. We, we only have the frequencies we have. But if we all the time fear that if I don't take the spectrum, it, it's like if it's my precious uh, um, belonging and, and, and I have to take care of that for 20 years, then the mindset is a mindset of scarcity. And that doesn't have to be necessarily the case. 
through spectrum management, through dynamic spectrum access, we could have uh, efficient use for the spectrum and many users at the same time, with the right conditions, of course. Um, enabling 5G. So we were talking about 5G, and I, I really like what Maria said about, uh, it has been a discussion about MNOs. That's how it has been. But right now, there is a 5G ecosystem. So we have satellite industry providing backhaul. We are having a lot of solutions for optical fiber, and that's how we will have also uh, that, that connectivity, for example, from the case of Verizon. But we will also need unlicensed devices. Many of the 5G use cases, just imagine virtual reality or augmented reality. You will have glasses, you will have wearables. And how are they going to connect to the network? Do you imagine if all those devices would need a SIM card, then the user would have to pay for a mobile phone or whatever device it will be in five years, but then he would also have to pay for the glasses, for the, for the it doesn't really make sense. And if it does, then there would be enough competition. So we think that those kind of devices, for example, should be able to connect with high throughput, with very good bandwidth capacity to unlicensed networks. And those are very small coverage uh, applications. So we, we think that the 5G ecosystem will need more than licensed spectrum. Uh, I just mentioned about it, but this could be for capacity, for example, those cases of the body area networks, but that could be also for coverage. We will have a lot of IoT applications in the countryside for agriculture. And how are we going to connect all those devices? If we want to make them affordable, and if we want to have competition and cheap prices for the final users, then spectrum shouldn't be a barrier. Mm, we are talking about the new generation of Wi-Fi. And let me tell you, I, I come from Colombia. For many people all around the world, I know that is the case in many places in Africa, many places in Latin, in Latin America, the first access to internet for many people is through a Wi-Fi hotspot. So we, right now we have, we have been used to Wi-Fi for the last 20 years, but there are, there are only two frequency bands, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. What's going to happen in the future? If everyone is using Wi-Fi, we have billions of users of Wi-Fi. That's how I explain what I do to my daughter. She says, Le Mom, what do you do? And then I, say, I work to have more Wi-Fi. And she says, oh, that's a great job. <laughs> so th this is important because we need to think about those users and about how we are going to integrate that to the 5G ecosystem. So from DSA, uh, and then I, I'd be happy to have more discussion about it, we are promoting different technologies. I like to say that dynamic spectrum sharing has different colors and flavors. It depends on the local needs. And that's also something important. From a spectrum management perspective, we are used to global harmonization. And that is a must. I mean, ITU has to do that, and all the countries have to work on global harmonization. But when it comes to unlicensed spectrum or spectrum sharing, that is not global harmonization. We could have spectrum allocation for fixed or mobile. That is worldwide harmonization. But then every country has the freedom to decide how to implement unlicensed or how to implement spectrum sharing. And that's why, for example, we have a particular framework for spectrum sharing in the, in the US, like CBRS, Citizen Broadband uh, Radio Services. Then every country ca could decide how to implement TV wide spacers or which are the conditions for interoperability in the six gigahertz band, for example, for Wi-Fi. So uh, we are promoting these technologies that are not globally harmonized uh, but that could really bring a lot of benefits in terms of coverage and in terms of capacity. Um, and I would like to say a final thought uh, about the discussion we just had previously, is that in spectrum management, we are used also to have a vision of incomes. When you talk to the government, and, and I was working with the government in the past, usually the ministry is saying like, okay, please, take into account that we could have two approaches. We could have a, a very high price spectrum auction, then the income will be very high. But usually on the other side is the investment that then could be uh, do in the network. So you could have a, 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 a trade-off between income and capacity for network deployment. And we think that right now there are many stakeholders that should be part of the 5G ecosystem. Small ISPs, neutral hosts, there are different companies uh, all around the world, small companies usually, they know their local, mar local market, they know how it works, and they should be able to deploy their own infrastructures. Uh, and I think uh, that's all for my presentation, so I'll be happy to answer more questions from the floor.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And you know, the, the um, concept of thinking about 5G as the ecosystem for 5G is, is very, very important. And the, the, the concept also about the, the need for a different mindset of how we think about spectrum. So thank you so much. We get to our last presentation today, and I think the focus on this one will be, you know, how do we make sure that no one is left behind? Uh, in the global thinking about these topics, you know, we're very excited about, you know, 5G and 6G and the opportunities that digital transformation offers. Uh, we're also concerned about the risks of exclusion. So the very, very old topic for those who have been working in the sector, you know, the, the concept of the missing link <laughs> is still there and, you know, the divide between rural and urban. So we're very happy to hear uh, your thinking, Daniel, about uh, your work in Rwanda and how you're thinking about this rural-urban divide. Great, and I'm gonna try to knit together a bit of this discussion we've been having here with the earlier discussion from this morning uh, as soon as the slides come up. Um, so, and I'm going to be thinking about a way to do policy analysis in industries where we have network effects and we have these kind of dynamics that we were discussing earlier. Um, so, yeah, so, so many digital industries have network effects. These include some services like Facebook and Google that there's a lot of discussion around. Uh, as well as if you kind of roll back time, mobile phone networks at the beginning and when you were building these in many countries, very few people had cell phones. And so, of course, having a phone is not very useful if there's no one you can call. So we're going to be thinking about cell phone networks as a case study, these kind of early cell phone networks as a case study for thinking about these industries with network effects. That is, let's see. Hmm. There's small pieces of my slides there. Um, yeah, if it's possible to see the whole thing, that would be great. Um, yeah, is, is it possible to see the whole slide? 5G here. Yeah. All right, we can work with this. Um, yeah, so, so network effects are <laughs> are, are, are present Very here. Very complicated issue. Yeah. Um, so, so network effects are, are present in, in tools for communication. These include phone networks, especially when not the whole population has a phone, or services that build on top of that. So what's up? Uh, for example, or Facebook or Instagram, uh, as well as systems for payment. So M-Pesa, WeChat, a lot of tools for digital payment are more useful when more people have them. And, and that means that when I choose to adopt one of these technologies, that could create benefits for myself, but it also can allow me to interact with another person that, who I would directly want to interact with, my contacts, I might want to call them. But if I adopt, my contacts may also adopt, and that could have spillover effects on their contacts. So one person's adoption of any of these technologies can generate spillover effects through potentially the entire network. And as a result, people are likely to under-adopt these technologies. So you kind of need, um, you need special policies or firms need to act in special ways. And Jean Turel mentioned often we, firms tend to subsidize early users to get a lot of adoption. 
of these networks. Um, but it also means that these networks tend towards monopoly. So it's useful if we have one Facebook because then we can all be connected on the same platform, but then we have a monopoly. And there's a lot of reasons why we might be worried that a monopoly might not provide so great service to people. And so one kind of tension that was brought up earlier this morning is that in these, in these industries, you often have this tension between wanting to regulate. So obviously, having a, a centralized player like a monopoly is, is, can be problematic. Uh, and so you may want to regulate them directly. These industries are, are rapidly changing, even as even telecom, which uh, we might have thought was not as rapidly changing. It turns out, as you can tell from this panel, is, is, is changing quite rapidly. Um, and so there, there are drawbacks to kind of sitting down in a room and writing down what we think are the best regulations for this. Um, on the other hand, we might want to push towards competition, but it can be very hard to, um, to achieve some level of competition when, um, because it's very hard to compete with incumbent industries. So like if you were going to launch a competitor to Facebook and you're asking for investment, I would probably not invest. Um, and the clicker is not working. So if it's possible to advance, we'll see. Um, I should also mention, so we were talking about these network effects. So these are, these are common in tools for communication and payments, but also some of the topics that we'll be talking about later in this conference. So platforms often have network effects that are a little bit different in character than the ones I'll talk about right in this talk. Um, and that, in, that includes kind of standard platforms we might think about online, but also platforms that are changing the face of transportation, including Uber, Lyft, or services that are analogous in developing countries like Ola Cab. And so um, we have this kind of trade-off. If, if we want to discipline these, these networks and make sure that they serve users in a good way, uh, we have a few policy options, but attaining some level of competition also tends to require regulation. If we want there to be uh, sustainable upstart networks that continue to, to comp compete in a sustainable way, um, we may need to intervene in a policy level. And so, whereas in the US and in Europe, we often think about these questions in the context of Google and Facebook, or, or what we think of as kind of leading edge technology, if you go to many developing countries, the newspapers are kind of peppered with the same kind of language of how do we manage dominant network industries, but instead, the dominant network industry that we're thinking about is cell phone networks. That's because these networks are big. They represent about 2.5% of GDP in sub-Saharan Africa, or 7% if, if you include indirectly affected industries. Uh, and they're also a platform for many other services, like mobile money uh, and the internet. So I'm going to do a case study thinking about Rwanda. And I'm going to focus, kind of go back in time. So we're not going to be thinking about uh, 3G or, or even 4G or any internet services, we're just going to be thinking about the time when voice service initially took off. And I'm going to think about the time from 2005 to 2009, which is when many Rwandans were getting their first cell phone. And basically, I'm going to demonstrate a way of doing policy analysis that counts for network effects, where we're going to develop a model, and we can put in any policy you want into the model, and we can find out the welfare effects as an outcome. And the, the kind of key thing that's going on behind the scenes is that I was able to get transaction records from the dominant operator. So basically, I see 5.3 billion transaction records that are occurring over this network, covering over 88% of the cell phones in the country over four and a half years. So very rich data on how people communicate in this country. And so th that allows me, together with some economic modeling, looking at the communication links that people use to put a dollar value on each link in this network. So how much does a person care to talk with their grandmother, for example? It turns out that link could be worth $4. Uh, and I would be able to figure that out based on this analysis. Uh, and then it also allows us to, to see how people would make different decisions. So my, my decision to adopt a phone is going to depend on the price of handsets, uh, as well as the benefits that I obtain from, from being on the network. And that allows me to compute what would happen in equilibrium if, if we use a different policy. And so I'll show three policy lessons that I found out using this, this method. Uh, one is on taxation. So obviously, telecom is a successful industry in many sub-Saharan African countries. And as a result, governments are always looking for ways to collect revenue. Telecom taxes represent 7% of, of government revenue in sub-Saharan Africa. And some of these taxes can be quite high. And in Rwanda at this time, there was a 48% tax on handsets. 
uh, which at the time people who were buying handsets were very wealthy. Now that's not the case anymore. Um, but so we can evaluate the effectiveness of that tax and by considering the welfare costs. So if you were to raise $1 in tax from other sources, that would cost about $1.22 to $1.37 in welfare. And that can be good because the, it's useful for the government to have these funds to build schools and, and for other important uses. Um, and then we can do the same computation for these telecom taxes. And if you ignore network effects, then the cost, the welfare cost of, these, of this $1 of tax revenue is $1.22. But it turns out that if I don't buy a phone, then my contact may not buy a phone, and their contact might buy, not buy a phone. And so if you include these network effects, the welfare cost of this, we're raising this on a $1 is $200.95. So huge implications of network effects here on taxation. And I have some ideas on how to make these taxes less burdensome. Another question that's come up in this discussion as well is how can we obtain service in remote areas? One common policy is universal service obligations. So we require firms to build out towers. Of course, there's a trade-off here. If we, we might require them to sit down in an office and, and require them to build towers where nobody lives or in places where it's not actually socially useful. So we want to know, is, is it actually useful when we require firms to build towers? So in Rwanda, uh, there was a government obligation that resulted in the building of about uh, a small number of towers. And, um, and we can evaluate their, their welfare effects. And you can see that these lowest 10 revenue towers were not profitable to build. Um, but they actually, if you count up the total social welfare, they were socially beneficial. So this is suggesting at least this policy in Rwanda had good welfare effects. One side point is that these benefits are extremely dispersed. So you might have thought building a tower in a remote village benefits the people in that village most. It turns out when you sum up these welfare numbers, 78% of the benefits come from people whose coverage is not affected. And that's due to these network spillover effects. So you should think of these networks as being very interconnected. This, this methodology is one way to analyze that. And then a, a final point here is that competition may help or hinder investment. So if I'm building rural towers, that will generate revenue from calls to the rural area, but it also will generate spillover effects elsewhere in the network. If I'm a monopoly, I internalize all of these, this revenue. If the, comp if the network is split under competition, then this revenue can be split. And there's kind of three effects here. There can be lower prices. Some of these network effects are foregone. But there's a countervailing effect, which is that I may want to build coverage so that I can compete against my competitor. And I can advertise myself as being the network with better coverage. So I, I traded these off in, a, in another simulation, thinking about what would have happened had we licensed an additional competitor in Rwanda. And so here, the, the price under monopoly is 100% of the monopoly price. If we introduced competition, the effects depend on how we set the interconnection rate, which is how much operators have to pay to terminate calls on the other networks. And you can see if we, if we turn that number very low, competition gets very intense and prices go down a lot. If we keep it very high, the outcome looks fairly similar to monopoly. Now, the immediate concern you might have is, well, if we push that number too low or if we al allow competition, then these firms will no longer make investments. They won't build coverage in remote areas. They won't find it profitable to do so. So we can compute the ROI of building these towers in remote areas under monopoly and then under competition. And you, you do see a trade-off here. So if you push this interconnection rate very low, you see the ROI goes lower than the monopoly level, but it starts higher. And what that means is that this firm actually finds it more profitable to build these remote towers when you allow some competition and you don't push the interconnection rate too far. And so here, if we were able to add a competitor earlier, that would have reduced prices by between 30 and 50%, actually seems to have, in would have increased investment at, if you chose this interconnection rate. This was a little bit higher than the government rate. And then we can also compute the welfare effects. And these are enormous. So introducing one additional competitor at this time under, under this interconnection rate would have increased the total welfare in society by the equivalent of 1% of GDP. And so this suggests that these emerging networks can have profound welfare implications for the poor.
this is a kind of demonstration of one method for thinking about policy in a setting where there's network effects, and I hope it will be followed by many more. Uh, this is kind of a laboratory for thinking about these effects. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think for an institution like us working on eradication of extreme poverty and shared prosperity, you know, we, we look forward to having more details about the welfare links and the taxation discussion. So very good. Uh, let me check with Nicolo how much time do we have? Five minutes. Oh my goodness, what happened with time? We thought we have 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, so five minutes uh, uh, open for a question from the audience. Thanks very much, a fascinating series of presentations. My name is Vivian Foster from the World Bank. Um, I wanted to ask Meyer to give us a little bit more of a sense of the um, pros and cons of the three uh, spectrum approaches she mentioned, the administrative, market-based, and common property. Uh, I also wanted to ask Ed, um, you know, it looks as though a single national network is uh, at least least cost for 5G, according to your work. Um, but how does that come about? Are we talking about a monopoly uh, structure? Are we talking about shared effort across uh, uh, different industry actors? And what about the efficiency cost of less competition? Uh, because there's also a dynamic angle to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So if I start from these spectrum management approaches, and I usually divide them into these three groups administrative allocation, market mechanism, and the unlicensed commons. And in fact, there are many two groups. The first two can be combined. It's about this defining the spectrum access rights as property rights, and then how you assign them to those who, are, who want to get them. And then the other part is this unlicensed commons approach, where you don't define access rights as such, but you define the rules and conditions under which you are allowed to access the band. And in many times this is in terms of the regulatory but, but like co conditions on maxim maximum transit power levels, duty cycles, and so on. And then the system themselves, they have to share the bands, and that often is agreed in the standardization on how they do that, that sharing. So going to these property rights and how they are defined and then how they are given. Traditionally, this administrative allocation was, was used for the cellular spectrum licenses, and that was, it worked pretty well when you had, a pretty you had an idea of how many players in the market you want. So there's no need to introduce any other mechanisms. You can just announce that we have these opportunities to deploy a network. Who wants to do that? And you get this application, and then you evaluate that. But as new entry was starting to emerge, it became, with 3G, it became more difficult that, like, how would the regulators then make these decisions in a fair and transparent way, how to introduce new, new entrant. And for that, this administrative allocation becomes more, more and more challenging, like how can you justify your decisions? And then many administrations chose to go to auctions, to market mechanisms. And auction is one example of these market mechanisms is in use. It was many times in 3G, not, not, not everywhere. Then in 4G, many countries adopted in 40, but not, not every, every country. So there's a lot of divergence. And that uh, is works when you have more, dema more demand than there is supply of the spectrum. So when there are more, more uh, organizations who want to apply, who want to get the rights, and you have less bundles to give them. And then you can use auction to define who wants to pay most to get these access rights. And then the unlicensed commons, the, it's very important, like Martha was saying, the Wi-Fi is the major technology that is deployed in these unlicensed bands. And it, it, it's, a, it's a great success story, because then you can just buy equipment, deploy them, and you don't need the permission to, to, to have the spectrum access rights, because that is already taken into account in the mechanisms how, how these devices were developed. And that has opened the door for innovation in an unforeseen way. And now there are methods in between these that are, that are appearing. So just, uh, is this on? Great. Um, so just going back to the question about a single <coughs> network. Um, so what I've seen so far is um, operators collaborating 
um, to deliver a single network in those areas where viability just isn't um, strong enough in order to, 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 to enable multiple networks. So they're still operating their own networks in areas where there's a big capacity need, um, but then in those areas where you know you just can't solve the coverage issue any other way, then it makes sense to move towards some sort of collaborative arrangement. Um, and this is actually taking place now in a variety of different countries. I think the economic context is important though, and that's that o across the globe, the average revenue per user is declining, and yet we're promising all of this these, these technical features that 5G is going to deliver, but 5G doesn't do much for coverage, and we need to solve the coverage issue somehow. Um, I think that's something that I really want to advocate here. We, we need to just get a basic service to most places to enable the economic benefits. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's a fascinating panel. My name is Rajat Kasturi. I just wanted to, uh, from ICRIR, just wanted to push back on that answer from Maria. Is there an alternative to auctions that you can think about in a transparent assignment of spectrum? Because often, you know, SMRA or combinatorial clock auctions, they result in very high prices, and that sort of impacts the rollout of the network and then imposes very high burden on the operators. And that given that, you know, you have very few incumbent operators, there are hardly any new entrants likely to come in. So you've got you know, incumbents who are going to bid for that spectrum. And often SMRA or CCA result in very high prices. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to compromise transparency because in lots of emerging markets, and I'm coming from the experience of India, but I'm sure this applies to other countries as well, is that you don't want to compromise transparency uh, as well as you don't want to impose very high burden. So what are the alternatives to these auction processes that can give you b the best of both worlds? Are there any? Exactly, is the point that when you design the auction process, you already have the expected outcome in a way that it's a very difficult job. It's extremely difficult. And we, when the people have studied, researchers have studied the outcomes of 3G auctions, 4G auctions, they realize that it has been very difficult. And then one country has done an auction, then the others have looked how that went, tried to change, tried to learn from that just before they announced their auction rules. And there is no single scheme that would, would work. Would, would take all these into account. So it's, it's really complicated. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Just to, inter just to interject from the OECD perspective on auction. Auctions are, are done in most OECD countries except for Japan, um, which does administrative selection procedure, for at least for most of the bands. But there's, it depends on the band what you're talking about, right? Um, really, the well, question inherent of what you're saying is the auction design. There's elements of the auction design that will lead to different outcomes, depending on the reserve prices, coverage obligations, and many other things. So in the design, policymakers are making a trade-off between efficiency gains and perhaps <laughs> fostering competition, or how do you promote coverage? So uh, much of the talk is not really a, a, a dichotomic auctions, yes or no. It's more, how do you design in order to incorporate this policy trade-offs? And, and much of it has to do with the reserve prices. If it's very high, then you will have high outcomes. You're also bearing other people to s new entrants that are not, you know, don't, don't have the highest willingness to pay, et cetera. Um, I would say that for like in the past three years, there's been around 35 auctions in OECD countries for 4G and 5G. And out of half of those, they use spectrum caps in, in, in auctions in order to promote competition and around a, a third of them has used coverage obligations because of the digital divide being such a pressing issue. I would just like to add something. Usually when you have a spectrum auction, mobile operators have a white license. In many cases it's a national license or sometimes it's a regional license. And what happens at the end is that most probably they will deploy their networks in the high populated areas so big cities. There are many regions that are not covered. So one way to incentivize competition, still have a transparent way to assign spectrum is the auction. But I, I think we, we think if there, there could be some additional things like spectrum or sh uh, use it or share it. So at some point, if the mobile operators don't have a business plan or don't have an obligation, because sometimes they don't have obligations for every local municipality or every place in the territory, 
there could be some kind of policies like use it or share it. So other stakeholders, small ISPs or any other participants could access that spectrum and use it in an efficient way. Very good, so thank you so much and please join me to applaud my panelists and thank them for the great participation today. <laughs>